All right, so Laura, we are back for another episode of Uncorked. Is it an episode? What is this? I don't even know. A show? I don't, I don't know what we call this. You know what? Episode three of season one, baby. Hey, I love it. I love it. I have a feeling that we're going to be like season 12. It's going to be like a Netflix <laughs> thing. You know what I mean? I'm going to be old and I don't know. Like I, Instead of your be, dogs, you're going to have your grandchildren and you're going to be modeling people. therapy on your grandkids. <laughs> I cannot wait for that day. You have no idea. You have no idea. So Laura, while we wait um, for some people to join, I just had to, well, first of all, I, we have to get a one really important kind of, um, I don't know if trivia is not the right word, I guess like a preference. So I was in the mood for chocolate, mm. which is a bad idea because <laughs> but I'm like, they're so little, right? So what I want to know is which one is your favorite when you buy the, 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 the bag of mixed chocolates? Do you like the regular Hershey's milk chocolate, the crackle with crispy rice, the dark chocolate, or are you a Mr. Good, what is it? Good, not good sense, good bar. Mr. Good bar with nuts. Which one's your favorite? I was thinking Mr. Goodyear, and that definitely wasn't it. That's a higher, isn't it? Mr. Yeah. Good sense is a sandwich. Which one's your favorite? I'm dark chocolate all the way. You're dark chocolate. So I'm yep. a huge fan of the crackle, the crispy. Really? Like, my, oh, I, yeah. It's kind of my thing. Most of the rest of my family, they're all with you with the with the dark chocolate. But um, yeah, kind of. I'm kind of digging the the little crackles. So, so Laura, what are you drinking tonight while we wait for some of our friends to join us? I am drinking a pale ale. Um, and it, I, I brought a special cup. <gasps> this is a special oh, wine glass. It's a throwback. It's called Casana. Yeah. I can't yes, even. Yes. So I'm throwing it back. Um, this glass is very special to me. It was given to me by the founder of Cassana, who was Sharon Gretz. And um, yeah, I mean, really, I owe Cassana everything. It's why I, I'm an apraxia expert. It's how I became a boot camper, a specialist. Um, it's like who helped my daughter. I mean, I, I just, yeah. So I, I had to bring it. I had to bring it. I what about you? It. Um, so I have my liquid therapy glass tonight because <laughs> that's kind of what this is. Normally I'm a red wine drinker, but as it gets warmer, I start to kind of like, um, a white, a Chardonnay. So this is actually, I just love the name of this. Can you guys see what it's called? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Isn't that perfect for us? It's perfect kind of for us. So, love it. I bought this or won this or whatever you call it at like a silent auction for a local preschool. So I have no idea where it's made or what it even is, but it is tasty. So I'm going with the white tonight. So Fun. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So and before, then also, wait, we have shirts too. Hold on. Let me oh, see your, oh, what's shirt. your shirt. So I'm speech nerd. Okay, you go because, first. Yep. I'm speech I love nerd. It. Is that you? from a specific place or was that one of yours? It was one of yours. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, this is my favorite shirt. I wear it to like every apraxia conference. Um, people probably like know me from this shirt, but <laughs> Let's see. this is like advocate oh. like a mother. <laughs> and it's actually from Littlest Warrior Apparel, which has a child they were inspired with with Down syndrome. So, but it's fitting for any special needs mom. It absolutely is. I love it. I love it. So we're sporting the, the nice apparel and I'm excited. So before we start talking about apraxia strategies, um, I just want to let you guys know, and I kind of showed, I can't remember, did I show these to Laura? I can't remember. My new parenting strategies for challenging routines. So I'm now obsessed cool. with Canva with making um, handouts. And so these are, if you have kiddos <laughs> who putting struggle, it mildly. Yeah, with um, like dental appointments. I have so strategies cool. for awesome. dentist, for my potty training handout. It's three pages long because I'm super excited about potty training strategies. So anyways, haircuts, uh, diaper changes, fingernail trims. Um, the haircut strategy is probably one that I would have given anything to have strategies like this when my son was younger because it was traumatic. I'm yeah, certain that he that has. Yeah, so anyways, those, um, I just finished those handouts. And then... As Laura and I start talking about apraxia, I did do another infographic. Laura, you you got a copy of it, right? You uh, I do. Give um, me just a second before you launch. Like yeah. uh, I'm I'm gonna post this to Instagram and I'm putting it in my stories. Okay, oh, okay. good. Okay, so I'm just yeah, gonna yeah. ramble, Laura. Yeah, you yeah, do you your ramble. Thing. <laughs> I'm gonna ramble and show you some of the finds that I purchased at the Dollar Tree store and at Target Dollar Spot because I <laughs> because she likes money. making us spend money. I know, but you guys, I just can't <laughs> stop my therapy brain. So, these were at 
uh, Dollar Tree, I'm pretty sure. Or yeah, I don't know now. Or, or yeah, I'm pretty sure Dollar Tree. You guys, they're dinosaur eggs. Look at them. So we can do dino. It's a two syllable word for our kiddos with CAS. They open so you can put baby dinos in there. Um, and then at Target Dollar Spot, look at the cute, colorful, um, different color, like a oh, pink fun. dino. And so we have mama dino and baby dino because I found the little ones at Dollar Tree. Oh, and I the love ones that. At Target Dollar Spot. So we can have dino eggs and we can have mama dino and baby dino. So we're getting two syllable words. Um, here's some other ones. So anyways, I'm just, and look at the cute colors from Target. It's like green and purple. Like where do you ever see a dino? Oh, I just, so I love, yeah. yeah, with the pastel colored Easter eggs. So make sure you stock up on these. I love doing um, treasure hunts for our little ones it's a way to incorporate play-based movement into speech therapy so they love to open the egg it's that mystery of what's in the egg and then you want to <laughs> fill it with target words that are related to you know the syllable shape that you're focusing on or whatever and then with Easter coming even you know just even if you don't celebrate Easter I love bunny it's another two syllable yes, word bunny, you compare great. these with books about rabbits you know and bunny hop so that's a way to um, you know create um, a more complex utterance and then at Dollar Tree, I just can't even get over the little animals. So these go great with my Silly Sounds cards. But again, there's a lot of two-syllable words. Hippo, zebra, Ella for elephant, tiger, monkey. So aren't they cute? And again, wow. you can put little objects in them. They're a dollar. Like, I just can't even... Um, because I'm totally obsessed with treasure hunts because I just love getting kids away from the speech therapy table if you're doing direct therapy and incorporating movement. It's something families can do at home as well. So I just yeah. had to share some of those. Oh, and look. Oh, see these dino eggs? Because you know me and all my books, right? So this is a, a dino <laughs> book. So, But again, on every page, just do dino, dino. Dino, it's how we get the repetition. And for older kids, do you remember this book? This is so old. Danny, oh my the gosh. dinosaur. Yes, so I do. So you got the two syllable words, Danny, Danny dino. dino. Yeah, and it's on yep. every page. So even if every you don't page. read the words, you're going to get like 75 repetitions of your target words. So we have that's, that's going to be a topic. We have our topic for next week, but I got to get my physical books again and we can have a like big oh. talk on it. Oh, we need to just do one on just books because yeah. I, I People really don't realize how, like how effective they can be. Like today I just was telling Carrie, I just came off, you know, a nine kid, um, back to back before I picked I up my kids from school. And, um, the favorite today was an old lady who swallowed a chick. And like, you guys, if you don't know the old lady books, I have all the old lady books and they're so versatile. I mean, and you can adapt them. So I wish I could just I know the book like <laughs> Carrie does, um, but I don't have it with me. But you know, um, for kids who are just in the early stages, for my little bitties, I can even adapt it and be like, "Oh my gosh, what's she gonna do? She's going to eat." And then I do that on every single page, yep. and I get eat, 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 eat. Or we can just say like it's gross and say, "Uh oh," like "Uh oh, what's she gonna eat now?" Uh oh. <laughs> or ew, I love ew. doing that. Ew. I like ew. if I'm trying to get a VC for, for that day. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, just literally you can use it with, with so many things. Or like today I had a kid who is working on um, fricatives and sick repeats. It's like, I don't know why she swallowed the chick, but she didn't get sick. And so then it's, but she didn't get, or I can work on carrier phrases. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And we're still yep. using principles of motor learning while we're working on a carrier phrase. I mean, books are fabulous. They are fabulous. And I always say, if you had to, if you said, Carrie, you can either have children's books or you can have store-bought toys. Which one do you want for speech Ooh, therapy? Yeah, I'd, I'd pick books, books too. I would books too. All the way. Um, because I have books for every speech target, for every mm -hmm. um, syllable shape, for, you know, for prosody. I mean, e everything. Same. Um, and so uh, it's pretty exciting. So we have well, and the other thing you do is it promotes literacy. So we oh. really, as speech therapists, like it's a double whammy because um, yes, toys are great. Obviously, Carrie, if you know Carrie, girlfriend's got toys. So <laughs> for her to say something like she would pick a book if she had to choose, it is because it does so many things. It promotes early literacy and love of reading and that interaction. Like, you know, plus, you know, you're getting the speech in. So. Yeah, and just in case some of you are new and haven't heard us before, because I talk about this probably every week, when you're <laughs> reading a book to yes. facilitate speech, please don't have the child sit on your lap. You want the book right here. So that that way, as you make the sound, as you say the word, whatever it is, the child is looking at the book, but they're more likely to see and visualize your movement. So when you sit a child on your lap and you're snuggling and it's night-night time and you're reading the book, you know. That's for, different. 
yeah, that's different. You want mm -hmm. the child on your lap. You're going to snuggle and give all the loves and read every word on the page. That's fine. But what Laura and I are talking about is using books to facilitate speech development, which is uh, you read books in a much different way than mm -hmm. when you just read a book for bonding and for joy mm -hmm. and for love. So I, that's why I think we could do a whole episode um, just on, on books because we, yeah, I was also specific. thinking books too. I used to work for title. I worked for title one schools for probably a decade and we had a lot of bilingual students there or, um, ESL, whatever, ELL, mm -hmm. whatever they're called mm -hmm. now. And, um, <clears throat> what's really nice about a book is it contextualizes the vocabulary. Yes. So rather than just having a card or rather than just, you know, having a toy and they don't even know your language. If we have a book that we are mm -hmm. sharing together, you have pictures, you have visuals and it contextualizes the language. I love it. I love yeah, it. I love it. I great. love it. Okay. So, <laughs> but that's not our topic. <laughs> that's not our topic tonight, right. right? That's not our topic. So what we are here, if you joined us last week or all of these are just naturally recorded. So you can go back and yeah. watch um, last week's, I think I just looked and we had 4,000 people watch it last week, last Yay, week's episode. Good. So what we did is we talked about strategies. Well, what was the infographic? Let me just grab it here so I can see what it is. A practice yeah, strategies it. parents can use at home. And so on my website, carrieebertseminars.com, if you go to the website and scroll down just a little bit, you can click on free downloads. And what I'm trying to do is every week when Laura and I are doing our uncorked episode, I'm trying to create a free infographic for you guys so that you like don't have to take notes while we're talking. We really want this to be like enjoyable. Hopefully you have a tasty beverage or yeah, um, please, 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 some chocolate or whatever <laughs> it is that you need. Um, but so today what we're talking or tonight, what we're talking about is how the SLP prepares for apraxia therapy based on Dun, da, da, da. PML. Laura, tell us about PML. Yeah, PML. I, I made a meme once on PML and I thought it was super funny. It was, you know, the guy who's holding his Dos Equis bottle and it's like, I don't always treat apraxia, but when I do, I use PML and it got like no traction. <laughs> and so I don't know, maybe I didn't post it on the right forum, but I was like, <laughs> mm, it's a really good one. That is good. That is good. <laughs> So tell um, but PML. Our followers, yeah, who don't know what it is, what is PML? So PML stands for the Principles of Motor Learning. And I will tell you, Carrie, you know, this is what we need for therapy for apraxia. And Carrie, I will tell you, I really feel like regardless of whether it's apraxia or phono or, you know, residual articulation at this point, I feel like PMLs should be taught right alongside of minimal pair, cycles, everything we learn in grad school because it is, it is, it is amazing. It's so effective. Yeah. And yeah. it's and it's and it's a necessary for apraxia, but if you know principles of motor learning and you apply them to other mm -hmm. aspects of your speech therapy practice, you are going to be a rock star. I mean, because it that's is right. it's amazing. They're amazing. So that's what if we want to talk ever, to you about. Yeah, if you ever listen to Amy Graham, um, she talks a lot about using principles of motor learning with her artic kids or her phonological yes. kids. Because yes. we know that <clears throat> Speech is a motor skill, right? Yes. The act of talking is a motor skill. And so the principles of motor learning are always going to be effective. Remember when it was like, was it our second week when we um, talked about dysarthria and we had Dr. Levy, yeah. we recorded that. And, you know, that's the other motor speech disorder, right? We have a praxy of speech and we have dysarthria, uh, yep. the dysarthrias. It's, it's a whole right, bunch right. of dysarthrias. But that is the other motor speech disorder. So these principles of motor learning apply, right? Whether it is childhood apraxia of speech or, or the dysarthrias. And so what Laura and I are going to do tonight, um, again, why I kind of like to do the infographic is because if you can't tell, Laura and I love to talk. And um, <laughs> so we can get really tangential and we could stay on one strategy for like an hour. And if we did that, <laughs> we could be here for eight hours. So I like doing this because hopefully it kind of keeps Laura and I on track. Um, I think tonight it could be tough to do this in an hour just because I really tried. How many did I do? Two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, eleven 11 strategies, you guys. So if, and tell us on here, cause I'm trying to kind of read as we go along. Tell me if you're a parent or SLP or somebody else, because I really want to know who we're talking to last week. If you didn't watch last week's episode and you're a parent, you really want to go back and watch last week's episode because tonight's information, I'm not going to say it's going to be totally over your head, but we're speaking to speech language pathologists tonight because speech language pathologists must understand the principles of motor learning. I don't necessarily expect parents to know what we mean by principles of motor learning, but what we do is give you guys strategies to embed into your daily routines at home. 
And so, um, oh, good. We have a lot of SLPs on here as well. I mean, we have parents too. And I had a parent message me recently. Laura, do, do parents ever ask you this? Um, I had a parent message me and ask, what should therapy look like for my child who has a praxy of speech? They wanted to I get know it all the time. Yeah. So I feel like the parents on here are going to benefit from this. Don't you think, Laura? I do. And, you know, Carrie and I have kind of talked about this before where what's, what's hard when, and, and I hear you because we're both parents. So right. knowing that, you know, we totally understand. What's difficult is that graduate level master degrees SLPs don't know how to treat this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so like they have all that background with speech and everything. And it is such a specific therapy that you really have to be working alongside an SLP that knows your child, that knows their sound repertoire, that knows what cues and stuff that they respond to because it's not a cut and dry here's a you know canned um you know therapy idea and this is going to help your kid it just doesn't work mm -mm. that way mm -mm. Mm -mm. so I do get that question all the time yeah. so for the parents on here I hope that this helps you to kind of know what speech therapy should look like and for the SLPs <clears throat> on here um again not all SLPs <clears throat> got much training in grad school uh this is how much I got and Same. so all all of my and I've been an SLP for 25 years so you guys I I mean I graduated um with my master's in 1995 so I'm mm -hmm. like ancient I get that but um, a lot of but our even so, I graduated in 08 and I had 14 loose leaf papers on it. 08, 08. Wow. That was when I actually got my actual master's degree. I was practicing on a temporary license and I was an SLPA before that. But 08, uh -huh. that's not that long ago. That really isn't. That really no. isn't. And so um, I, I feel like we just have to keep having this conversation. And if you follow Laura and or I on social media, you know, we talk about this stuff all the time. And sometimes when I post on apraxia, like I posted on apraxia today, um, I'm like, are people sick of hearing this? Like, you do, I, I just sometimes think, I know I say this. Over no way. Over. No, so, because you know how many light, like you can tell by the response that's received when you post right. it. Right, yeah. right. So I never, I mean, I always do appreciate feedback because if I started having people say, Carrie, you talk about this too much, like enough already, move on. But I still get, I get so many uh, messages from uh, providers asking the same questions yeah. over and over. So I'm like, I need same. to keep sending the same message because yeah. I just don't feel like we're reaching, you know, everybody. So my, uh, Laura and I, our hope is that um, Uncorked will grow, that, um, you know, we'll continue to get more people who will join us. Because if you're an SLP, I know you don't get credit for this, but this is like free CEU stuff. I mean, the <laughs> I mean, that's you know, how we felt with Dr. Levy. We're like, oh, dang, absolutely. we should have earned some credit. Uh, you know, I mean, as a professional speaker, I, uh, before COVID, I traveled around the country and gave seminars every single week in a different city. And so I miss doing that. So this is like my outlet now. Laura and I get to, I mean, I literally, like, I'm such a speech nerd because <laughs> I look forward to this every week. This is like what gets me. I'm like, I can't wait to hang out with Laura, you know? So <laughs> yeah, same. It, is, so it is so much fun. So, okay, let's go ahead and get started. And I just saw some Somebody say, hey, can we split this into two nights if it gets too long? So you know what, guys? If at 8 o'clock, if we're yeah. only halfway through, I think that's exactly what we'll do. So I think that's a good idea. Jacqueline is, Jacqueline, you're a genius. So yes, um, I think that, because um, I don't want to rush this, and I want to, you know, be able to go over these. Um, so let's go ahead and start. Laura, you want to start with the first one? Do you have Yeah, that? sorry. I was getting distracted by Facebook because we have someone from Greece here. Oh, hello. I would I love know. to go to Greece. Laura, do you want to go to Greece sometime? Oh. Let's do an uncorked in Greece. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? It'd be so fun. Live from Greece. <laughs> live uh, from Greece. Oh, I my love gosh. It. I love I it. Can't, I can't. I can't. Okay, I'll focus. I'll focus. Yes. Yeah, so okay, so okay. Uh, let me go back to the first one. Uh, so um, when I was talking about to Carrie about this one, definitely um, the precursor to principles of motor learning is you have to have motivation. If someone isn't motivated to do a motor act like playing basketball or, you know, anything like that, they're not going to do it. You know, so we need to inspire motivation. That's number one. And that's especially important when you have little bitties and in early intervention. I mean, you know, they, 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 they want to play. They don't want to sit there and do work. And so we have to inspire motivation through them. But here's the thing is that sometimes I'll get referrals in my office and I will rarely take someone under three, but sometimes I will. And the, you know, the issue that I see is these kids have a hard time with just general imitation. So they don't even understand the structure of a play-based therapy, much less what I'm going to need to do eventually in a direct based therapy. So really where we have to start is yes, we inspire motivation, but let's just understand imitation. Let's just understand like, ah, I do something silly and ah, you do something silly or, you know, um, not even with vocals. It could be right. just with our hands. Like, you know, I had my car the other day and I was like, boom. And then I went like this 
And then he went boom. I'm like, yay. And that's a precursor. Like I need that because if the child doesn't understand, I do, you do, I do, you do. I do, you do speech is going nowhere because that's the hardest um, channel for them to produce speech. What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, nonverbal imitation is for me one of the absolute basic foundation skills in order to address any missing skill, right? Any skill that yeah. is, um, the child is struggling with. So unfortunately, it seems like so many of the little ones that get referred to us, they're missing that basic foundation skill. Now, I don't want to get too technical here, but praxis, right, is the root word of apraxia. Praxis means skilled movement. And one of the components of praxis is initiation, and yep. another component of praxis is imitation. Yeah. So what's happening is we are getting these kiddos who are missing the first two steps of praxis. So we've got um, a child and the parents, caregivers, teachers, whoever, they're concerned because the child is not what? Talking. Talking. Okay, so everybody's like, speech lady, make him yep, talk, yep. talk, talk, talk. And <laughs> speech lady is like, yo, dude, I get that he's not talking. Hey, right, like, we got to back this train up. <laughs> that's the least of my concerns, right? we got to go back now yes. because we're missing foundation skills. So what we're yeah. going to do is implement AAC. We're going to get yeah. some way for the yeah, child to exactly. communicate, whether it's sign language or some kind of a robust, um, you know, AAC device or whatever it is. I'm not an AAC specialist. I don't claim to be, but that's why we have specialists in different areas within yeah. our field, right? Yeah. So we're going to move language forward so the child has a way yeah. to communicate so that the child doesn't get extremely frustrated because without a way to communicate, children rely on behavior such as hitting, biting, spitting, pinching, you know, squealing. And it makes sense. Right. Everybody has to communicate. So we get communication going, but then what I'm going to do is back the truck up and start with non- verbal imitation, right? Because like Laura yeah. said, you have to have basic reciprocity. And what is yeah. reciprocity? It is that back and forth exchange. So what Laura and I are doing tonight is reciprocity, right? Yep. We're trying to include our, our viewers on the side too, to make it, you know, kind of <laughs> more interactive. But what Laura and I are doing are we're, we're demonstrating for you reciprocity. So Laura, if I got a two-year-old uh, on my caseload who didn't demonstrate like basic reciprocity, one of the first things I might even do is have the parent, the child roll a ball back and forth. Love it. Because that's reciprocity, right? This Love idea it. of give and take, give and take. Talk to us, Laura, about like the power of songs and finger plays. Yeah, I mean, this is my favorite because um, nursery rhymes play an important part in development, and I feel like they're really underrated now. Uh -huh. But mm -hmm. nursery rhymes are so important in um, they follow a melody of speech. They um, have specific rhyming patterns. It gets that pre-literacy phonemic awareness. But what I really love about finger or about nursery rhymes is that a lot of times they include imitation of motor movement. So yeah. if you think about all your favorite um, favorite ones, and sometimes I modify. You know, itsy bitsy is this is pretty complex. Um, I have a little girl that can't isolate a pointer. Yep, and we go like this. We put it yep. on top, and it's itsy bitsy. We have down, out. You know, sun. I mean, whatever you want to do with that little teacup. You know, you're pouring out, or you don't even have to make it that specific. You can just fall over, like, mm -hmm. and we off, and you know, all fall out, and then we fall down on the ground. And what does the child it. do? Fall down on oh, the ground yeah. with you because it's fun and they don't right. even realize that they're engaged in some therapeutic process. And exactly. I really feel like this is important because parents might look at a therapy approach like this. They might listen to us tonight and be like, well, you're not doing simultaneous production and you're not targeting mm -hmm. sounds in their repertoire and you're not doing all these things Carrie and Laura said to, for you to do. But then that's why I really wanted to drive this home is that it is very important. There are prerequisites to apraxia therapy and this is a major one. And that's why it's first on the list. I mean, and I really why, yeah, yeah, yeah. try to put them in an order of, look, you have to start at the top. So before we move on, because remind me to talk to you about teddy bear, but somebody asked, will this, oh, be yeah. we'll say, will this be accessible afterwards because I have to leave? These are always accessible afterwards, you guys. These automatically record. All you have to do is either go to Laura's Facebook page, SLP Mommy of Apraxia, or my Facebook page, uh, Carrie Ebert Seminars. You can go back and watch the previous ones. We normally air every Thursday night, so just 
look at the date and go find that tonight or Wednesday night only because tomorrow night is Monday Thursday and and we have church and so anyways we decided to to do it a day early but normally it's on Thursday so um, yes they're always accessible you guys so don't ever panic if you can't watch or if you have to leave early or if you missed last week's episode um, that's what I love about doing these Facebook lives is we it's really pretty simple for me and I'm not like a high-tech person but they're always available so yes 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 um, don't worry about that. So if you have to leave, you can leave. So Laura was talking about songs and finger plays. I have to tell you the very first song I always introduce is Teddy Bear. Now, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Teddy Bear. Teddy Bear, Teddy Bear. Teddy Bear, turn, turn around. around. Teddy, Teddy Bear, Bear Teddy, Teddy Bear. Bear. Touch, Touch the ground. ground. <laughs> and then it's show your shoe. And then yeah. bow, that will do. So the reason I love Teddy Bear so much is because these are big, gross motor movements. Yeah. Now, if I start with Itsy Bitsy Spider. Yeah, that's a very fine, fine motor that's skill. Fine that's fine motor, true. okay? So I always start with big, gross motor movements. And that's why I talked about this book last week. Um, High Five Animals is one of my favorite for um, trying to establish early just kind of, you know, high-fiving and then high-fiving my hand and then mom's hand because this is doesn't require a lot of fine motor movements, yep. right? It's pretty gross motor. They don't have to be extremely accurate. So that to me is really important. Um, the second song I always introduce is um, Row Your Boat, but not the regular tune. Now, I can't sing, so please don't make fun of me. But if the <laughs> child will tolerate holding their arms, the reason I like to actually row and hold their arms um, in non-COVID times is because it gives joint compression. It's very um, regulating <laughs> the nervous system. So row, yeah, row, I love row, that. row, down the jungle stream. If you meet a crocodile, don't forget to scream. Ah! <laughs> and the second verse is row, row, row your boat gently back to shore. If you meet a lion, don't forget to roar. Roar. So the reason <laughs> I love this one is because screaming and roaring are pretty guttural sounds. They're produced way back here. All you have to do is open your mouth and turn your motor on. Doesn't require a ton of articulation. So it's phonation, yep. but not articulation. So what yep. we've done, this is intentional, you guys. Yes. We, have, we have simplified the motor plan yes. by removing articulation and only focusing on phonation. So we're adding in these actions, hoping they'll do them with us, but then just opening the mouth and turning the motor on that's what I need kids to do is, buddy, I want you to become a communication risk taker. I just want you to open your mouth and somehow turn this motor on. And whatever comes out, Laura and I are going to shape that. You know what I mean? Yep. Over time, we're going to shape that until it is the adult version. But right now, I just, you got to get your motor on for me, right? Because then you know that I, reminds Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, it just reminds me, you know, um, before I was a specialist in this even, um, I was an SLPA. So I had experience in it because in the school districts, they needed me as the third or fourth session person, mm -hmm. right? Because you mm -hmm. need the frequency of visits. So I did attend training, like principals paid for me to have trainings in apraxia. And then I just followed the SLP's treatment plan. Um, and so I, I did have some experience, but you know, fast forward to when I'm an SLP on my own and this kid is five and he comes on my caseload in kindergarten, completely nonverbal, but somehow he has a not like he has an IQ, nonverbal IQ of like a hundred and like 40 something. Like I was like, oh, oh my God, and this kid isn't talking. Um, and so definitely no, there, there wasn't any autism, which does compound things. That's the only reason I bring it up, but he did not have autism. And so, and, and what it was is at this point in life, he had resigned himself to the fact that he was not a verbal communicator. He could not do it. And I knew it. And so I just, like you said, needed to get him to turn his voice on and I needed him to want to engage in a therapy process, but we're in the schools. He's five. I'm in, you know, a speech therapy room, but I got a beach ball. And what we did is we played beach ball and we went back and forth and back and forth and he had fun and he trusted me. And I think what therapists worry about, especially with parents watching, is it looks like I'm just playing and not doing anything, um, you know, where I didn't have to, I didn't know when to answer to in the school setting. But parents, you know, and professional parents know that there is a purpose <laughs> and right. professionals know that it's okay to tell your parent what that purpose is. Like, I need right. this child to like me. I want this child to play with me. I need this child to understand reciprocity. I need him to understand understand imitation and once we got that ball so we were going back and forth that's exactly where I started was with a guttural awe and I was like hey I just want you to try and turn your voice on 
Like, Mm -hmm. and he shut down. He looks like freaked out. This is after like five sessions. And I'm like, it's fine. And then, you know, cause it's a beach ball. I just bop him in the face. And I was like, and I was like, do it to me, do it, do it. And he's like, you know, I can't hit a teacher. I'm like, do it, do it. And he hits me. And I was like, ah, and that's how I got it. And that's how we got the reciprocity of ah, ah, ah. And it was all through play. It was through imitation. And it was starting with, like you said, a known achievable, achievable target. See, that almost makes me want to cry because I, I just feel like sometimes speech therapists are trying to work like at the word level. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Even, they're not communication risk takers yet. So no. we just, you found all ah, with a beach ball. I had a kid who loved Kung Fu Panda. So we did hi yeah. Yes, hi yeah. Awesome. And we walked around the room, hi yah, and we'd stack blocks and we'd hi yah. And the first that's time awesome. I was a freaking lunatic, right? But then after <laughs> I started getting success, then when the kid would run off, I'd say, okay, let me talk to you. Like as I'm out of breath, why we're hi yahing everything in your house. So it's, <laughs> so important that therapists um, do intentional modeling and do coaching and explain why you're doing what you're doing. We are yeah. not as SLPs just randomly, haphazardly playing. We're not just good with kids, but what we're not very good at, unfortunately, as a profession is telling parents what the very specific strategies are that we are focusing on through play. We're not very good at that. So parents, you need to ask. You need to have the confidence to ask your SLP, why are you doing that? What, yes. what is this? How is this going to help him? You know what I mean? With his speech development, I do. your SLP should be able to answer that question. There should never be a time when you can't stop your SLP and they go, Oh, well, what I'm focusing on now is getting him to look at my face or what I'm focusing on now is just getting him to turn his motor on or whatever yep. that is. So, um, I on my website too, I wrote a blog post specifically for that. And it's the top 10 questions for parents to ask SLPs. And it really, in that blog post, if you search my website, SLP mommy of a practice, it does it's it does tell you have the confidence to ask and I do say in that too any therapist who is confident in the treatment approach that they're using Mm -hmm. will have no problem answering your questions and if they do well perhaps you got you you have your answer unfortunately and then I also challenge SLPs in that post to read through those questions and ask yourself Mm -hmm. in the disorders that you're treating can you answer these questions right confidently and if you can't that probably means you need to seek out more information absolutely one of the um, posts on social media that I did I'm going to say two weeks ago I don't know but I mean it was fairly recently was um Activities are not the same thing as strategies. Therapy yes, activities I love are not that one. the same thing as therapy strategies. So we <laughs> focus so much in our pediatric SLP world of, ooh, what, what activities do you have? Do you have an activity for Easter? Do you have an activity for St. Patrick's Day? Ooh, activity, activity. I'll be honest with you. I don't really care what your activity is. I mean, Laura and I can talk <laughs> right. all day long about, you know, if you got on here late, I mean, I was talking about some of the dino and, you know, some of the things, I mean, I'm all about activities. Don't get me wrong because yeah, I work yeah. with kids and I have to find a way to engage them and keep that reciprocity and interest there. But your skilled billable service has nothing to do with your cute Pinterest worthy <laughs> activities. And I don't mean to like, you know, call everybody out here, but your skilled billable service is the strategies that you are implementing during those cute Pinterest worthy activities. And yeah. that is what should be documented because I should be able to look at your progress notes and understand that you are using principles of motor learning in your therapy because you're going to document not your activities. I don't care that you did two puzzles and read three books <laughs> and did a shape sorter. I really don't care. What I care about is what strategies did you use to facilitate speech motor planning skills. That's mm-hmm. what I want to know, right? So it's about yeah. our strategies. So Amy first, Graham, I just, I don't know what I was watching, maybe a story of hers. If you guys don't follow Amy Graham, especially on Instagram, Graham Speech Therapy, right. she's amazing. But I feel like someone asked her how she plans for a session and her answer was exactly my session. My answer. It was, yeah. well, I don't really, I know what targets I'm going to work on. So I'm going right. to look on, you know, where the child's at, what are the targets that I want to potentially get? And then we're going to go into that session and we're going to meet the child where they're at, knowing right. in my, the back of my head, what targets and strategies I'm going to have to work on. Right. Absolutely. It changes yeah. everything. I don't ever plan for therapy. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but I really, as long as you know what you're focusing on, right? You know what your yeah. I mean, target word therapy mm-hmm. is a big deal for me. Know what your five target word yeah. is there. So let's move on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on. So we've done one strategy and we're 35 minutes in Laura. Okay, oh gosh. So, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you. So okay. your next one, you talk about select target words that are meaningful and functional as opposed to taking random words. Um, you know, even you have from commercialized speech therapy programs, but I even see this from without, you know, the, like, 
you know, speech therapists might pick moo. And uh -huh. um, unless you're living on a farm, moo doesn't tend to be pretty functional. So what do you mean by that? Select target words that are meaningful and functional. Well, what I really want is, so we know there will never be enough speech therapy for um, there to be enough repetitions for, to build new motor plans. So I wanna pick words that are naturally high frequency words that are gonna occur in the child's day-to-day -day, you know, conversations and interactions outside the four walls of the speech therapy room. So that's the problem. If I pick the word dino, let's say that's a word because I bought this cute dino. So I'm like, we're gonna work on dino. <laughs> what if the kid doesn't really, you know, he's not right. really into dinos and he right. doesn't have any dinosaurs at home and he doesn't read dinosaur um, you know, books. So right. He does it. So why? Why? Well, because this is a, not a good term. Word, Perry, we need to work on two syllable words. Well, we do. But why wouldn't we pick cookie? Because the kid freaking loves cookies and him and his mom make cookies every day, you know, or every other day. And um, yeah, or sometimes I might look at the same sound, right? If you have dino, let's just switch it to dino for dinner. We help my mom make dino every uh -huh, day uh -huh, and uh -huh. just get something there. If that's motivating, you know, and that's the syllable shape you want and the sounds that you think need to be targeted, you know, do right, that. Right. So that's the whole point is I always say with our real little kiddos or our, I don't even mean little, I mean our minimally verbal kiddos, make sure, can the child say mama and dada? Oh, papa. I mean, I'm just telling you as a mom, my son did not say mama until he was over three years old. I don't know. Yeah. Did Ashlyn say mama early? No, it was well over three and she did it in therapy. And then, you know, I can get on a tangent about that, how even though she could say it in therapy, she couldn't say it spontaneously, but that's mm -hmm. a whole other thing. But no, I didn't hear it either until after three. Right, right. So and it's heartbreaking. It was it is pretty heartbreaking. heartbreaking. It is. And so, you know, one of my therapy activities to elicit mama is to play the mama game or the daddy game or the papa game. And that's just <laughs> where mom goes and hides and we're in the house and all of a sudden I go, mama. I, <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's a good idea. Hands. And then mom jumps out and the kids laugh <laughs> and runs and hugs mom. And then we say, mama, go hide. And mom runs off. And then I look at the child with this great <laughs> and I go, yeah. mama. And we just do this. <laughs> For like a half hour straight, and I'm not kidding you. No, oh, they could do it all. The kid day. is saying mama, you know. Oh. I mean, it's because it's so motivating because it's fun, and then you know, we can use Jimmy Fallon's book, <laughs> um, Mama, right? Which yeah. on every single page, so cute. yeah. So, um, yeah, you want to pick meaningful, relevant, functional words, but the key is they should be high frequency words. So, I had a little guy, I asked his mom, What five words do you want Micah to say? And mom looked at me, she goes, I don't need five words, I just need one word. Mm. I was like, What one word do you want Micah to say? And she's, you you know, it's Spider-Man. She wants him to say Spider-Man because oh, no. he loves Spider-Man, right? So we work on, I think I've told this story, but we work on an approximation, ba ma, you know, for yeah. Spider-Man. Yeah. But because he says it like 300 times a day, you get yeah, tons it's so of repetition. Motivating. Yeah. So what words are um, motivating? What words are naturally occurring? What are those high frequency words? I would also caution, and this is a whole, we could do a whole episode just on this. Requesting is only one function of communication, right, Laura? Being able to request. Oh, yeah, right? so it's many other ones. One. Okay, so if you're talking about first request words, you want the child to use a word to request. Be very careful about teaching more and please as first request words because they can be used for absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. And I find uh, it's harder than to get the kiddo to use more language. So just, you know, be careful if you're using, when you're thinking about first request words. So um, again, that's something that we can, we can talk about at a different time. What are your thoughts on that? Do you have any other thoughts on high frequency words and no, I was going to segment into your next one by asking the question, because you brought up Spider-Man. Um, you know, speech therapists will ask me all the time, well, Carrie, you know, he's interested, Laura, he's interested in Spider-Man and My Little Pony, or, you know, like another girl, My Little Pony, or, you know, they have to say Grandpa, there's no going to Papa or to have oh. an approximation. You know, what do I do with this? Because those are the words that the parent wants. And so that really leads us into our next one, I think, nicely. Yeah, um, base speech targets on the child's current phonetic inventory and preferred syllable shapes. Yeah, yep. so you do want to know. Um, you should have a phonetic inventory. If you're an SLP, right, parents, you may not know what we mean by phonetic inventory, but SLP should actually keep track of what sounds and what syllable shapes, right? So parents, if you ever see um, an SLP, right, like CV, C stands for consonant, V stands for vowel. So a CV word is a consonant vowel word. Laura, I'm going to put you on the spot. Give us a couple examples of a CV word. 
me go my no to um day <laughs> yep yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so you can put just, me on the spot i do I it did. all day long <laughs> I did. Right? so it's just a a word that doesn't have a consonant on the end right so every yeah. every word has to have at least one vowel sound okay that's just part of the english language you have to have a vowel sound in it um so you could have a vc syllable shape Yep, I can do it too. You want to ask that too? <laughs> yeah, what? Give us a couple examples of a VC vowel. Concept. All right. So my favorite VCs for functional: eat, out, on, in, um, up, up. Oh, up. how can yeah, I forget up? Yeah, <laughs> up is actually so, a really big one. Right. So <laughs> the thing is, Laura and I are going to actually have a list of what sounds are in the child's inventory. Yes. What sounds? So exactly he says ma. Do. He says da. He says ba. Let's say those are, and ma is for mama, da is for dada, ba is for bye bye. Let's say that's what he has. Sure. So, what we're hearing is a lack of syllableness, right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't say mama or dada yep. or bye bye, right? He says just the first sound. So, he has consonant vowel syllable shapes. Mm hmm. And he's got really just a neutral vowel, right? But he has mm -hmm. three consonants then. So yeah. that's what Laura and I are going to document. So, and, you know, we could, I don't know, the, the one example that always comes to mind, and I probably already told it because this was one of my first kiddos that I worked with that had a really um, difficult time um, just combining sounds together. So he could give me sounds in isolation, but he really struggled putting sounds together, even into a consonant vowel syllable shape. But his best friend in the whole wide world was his grandpa. And of course, mom wanted a, him to call him grandpa. And I'm like, it's just not, you know, we're not there, but he wants to be able to talk about him and talk to him. And so I asked mom, can we simplify it to Papa? And she's like, well, exactly. he doesn't really want to be called Papa, but no. we talked about, so they finally all agreed as a family. Yes, Papa is fine. Well, the little boy, his only syllable shape and only sound he had was dope. Dope. <laughs> that was it. So I'm like, okay, how am I going to get to Papa from dope? So I said to mom, I said, what if we do? Because he loved the O vowel sound. I felt like O was for some weird reason. Every kid is different. That was the vowel sound that came out easiest. Uh -huh. one. So we did po po. And guess okay. what? He got it. He got po. And then we were able to get two two times po yeah. po. So yeah. Papa, Grandpa became Papa, became po po. Because what we had to do was look at his his syllable shapes, his inventory. So it is important that you know. So I ask parents to give me a wish list of words. I literally have them write it down. So Laura, um, I want you to write down, um, you know, 10, 20, 30 words that you wish Ashlyn would say. Let's say Ashlyn's two, she's, you know, minimally verbal. So you write down 25 words. So what I'm going to do is the SLP is look at that list. List, and then I'm going to look at her sounds in her repertoire. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look at her preferred syllable shapes, and I am going to pick the first five targets. Yeah. Does that make sense based on what she's capable of doing? Okay, so here's another question, Carrie. Then I get this one. But Laura, you know, they only have three consonants and a handful of vowels. How do I get more sounds? Is that where we start? Um, it, so <laughs> this is tough because... Everything in the apraxia therapy world says don't ever work on speech sounds in isolation. But what I'm going to say, since I work primarily with toddlers, I mean, I work with them as young as 15 months old, is that if you only have don't, that's the only sound you make. I have to teach you how to make new movements with your mouth. I have to. And so that is why I'm such a big fan of sound effects, right? Yeah. So while moo may not be relevant and meaningful in the context of day-to-day -day conversation, I use sound effects in an effort to try to build the child's phonetic yeah. inventory. Does that yeah. make sense? So It does. Moo, and I feel like people get so confused about yes, this, though. You yes. know, because like, okay, let's, let's not talk about your kid with dough. Let's just talk uh -huh. about a kid that you said that had, you know, three consonants and two vowels. And yes, mm -hmm. most of the vowels were neutral neutralized or whatever. Okay. There is so much work you guys to be done with just that. Mm -hmm. Like in that scenario, when a child is able to say, uh, you know, a few different consonant combinations and a few different vowel combinations, I would, I would challenge you to make sure that they can say them consistently in all contexts, yes. which means motor learning has occurred. If right. they can't, if the parent is like, well, you know, sometimes it says it here, sometimes he can't because he's just lazy. And y'all right. know if you've watched us, Carrie and I, this is not a lazy situation, but that's what parents think because if they've heard the child say it in one context once, but don't in another, they assume, well, he must just be being lazy or digging his heels in. So there's just so much work to be done with the stuff yeah. they can already, you, you already hear them say, unless you have a scenario like Carrie just said, where you're dealing 
women with like extremely limitations. Limited. Which we are in early intervention. Again, Laura works primarily with okay, kids. Yeah, yeah. Three. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Primarily with kids under three. Yeah, and I'm yeah, telling you, 99.9% .9 of the kids I evaluate, I'm lucky if they have one consonant. Really? One okay, yeah, oh. that would be a difference. By the time they're three, oh, we've yeah, at least acquired yeah. some and stuff. And that's why yeah. we want them to have early intervention, right? So they yes. come to you for direct therapy and yeah. have a kinetic inventory. The kids yes. I work with, I mean, a lot of times I have eh. Eh, the tongue rests oh, wow. with more yeah, than yeah, yeah, yeah. is all I've got. And I'm like, well, I mean, I can't, I don't, I can't even do a motor <laughs> dynamic motor speech assessment, but I'm telling you, the kid doesn't have a phonetic inventory. So how's yeah. he going to learn to talk if he doesn't even have a phonetic inventory, which is where my silly sounds come in. And sound effects are wonderful because they can be incorporated in play time. They can be incorporated into story time, song time, bath time. So that's where we, when you're at the park, Love sliding it. down the slide, you're going to do 50 repetitions of we. Yeah. Wee, and you're just going to. That's why it's so good that we have those two perspectives because I feel like if people listen to me, uh -huh. they might, they, you know, but they're working with a two year old that doesn't have any sounds, then they're right. like confused. Or uh -huh. if they listen to you and, the, and you're saying, well, yeah, try and, uh -huh. you know, learn new sounds. And then they private message me and I'm like, no, 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 no. Let, oh, let's try and get that. the sounds that we already have. Yeah, it gets confusing, but it, it is does. all where we're all like meeting the child where they're at. So and that is like the best thing. I think the two most powerful things you've said tonight, and I forgot to bring this up after you said it, but somebody messaged it on the side is, you use the word trust. And I'm going to tell you right now, yeah, it's tell the child trust that you are not going to tell them. You're not going to say, say ball, say cow, say moo, say, say. If, if, if you start pressuring them to do things that they know they can't do, right? Um, Ooh, what is going on? Um, quit. I have some weird thing popping up on my screen. Um, something oh. that Forth wants to update, you know, in the middle of a Facebook <laughs> Live. Um, but uh, so the child needs to trust that you're not going to withhold items. Like, oh, do you want the bubbles? And then you, you offer it, then you pull back, say bubbles. Come on, buddy, yeah. say bubbles. And the kid is like, once you lose the child's trust, I'm going to tell you right now, um, you're going to have a tough time winning it back. And so Again. it is about trust. Um, and then what did you just say? Because it was the second most powerful thing you said before I um, trust and meeting the child where he's at. That's it. Meeting the child where he's at. So are there some five-year-olds who are going to be minimally verbal? Who are Yeah, like my five-year-old with the ball. I Thank had to start you. with awe. Thank you. But are there going to be some um, two-year, nine-month-old kids who have 15 single word yep. approximate. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yep. that's why don't ask us about age. Don't say, how do you do therapy with yeah. a two-year-old? How do you do therapy with a five-year-old? That's irrelevant to Laura and I. What yeah. we want to know is what sounds are in their repertoire? What are their preferred syllable shapes? Um, so Laura had talked about too, where a child will say a sound in one context and they can't produce it in another. So in my, the way I look at this is the child has not, does not have that phoneme readily available. So if you have a child who can say mm in milk, let's say he says milk clear as a bell and you're like, okay, so he's got the mm sound, right? Mm -hmm. But he can't say moo nope. or right. me or yep. my or more. And those words are phonetically less complex, motorically less complex than milk, which is actually pretty complex. So <laughs> we're like, as SLPs going, how can he say milk and not me? or moo, mm -hmm. or my. I'm telling you right now, I have this theory, again, it's just a theory, that our apraxia kids are learning words in a gestalt manner. They're learning entire words instead of developing sounds through babbling, because we know they don't babble as much. So instead of practicing these sounds and babbling them, they're learning whole chunks. They're learning entire words, milk, and we're then giving them credit for having the mm sound. I'm telling you, a lot of these kids have not, they don't, they haven't motor learned it. They don't have the M sound readily available because they can only use it in one context. Well, that so is the same. Well, to add to your theory, not that that's my theory, but what I was sitting here thinking about as you were saying it, to add to that, that really is what we're talking about when a child combine words, mm -hmm. but they're not really. Like when they say, ah, done, mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. done is technically two words, but they have not learned it as two words. They uh -uh. do not understand all and done. Right. They understand it as a unit, ah, done. Mm -hmm. I've done. So they can't use yeah. all with any other word. They can't exactly. use done. Exactly. Yes, they can't yes, say yes. done mama or yeah, all Yeah, that's done. what it made me think of. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like our kiddos don't actually have this inventory of sounds readily available to them. They have specific word units that they say, and mm -hmm. we end up as SLPs giving them credit for having this repertoire of sounds. But my concern is they, um, it's not truly a a sound that has, it's not motor learned. They can't use it in a wide variety of contexts. 
Yeah. And what's nice, though, is that if you do have that sound in milk, for example, which would be odd, um, as Carrie yeah, mentioned, because it's be pretty much historically yeah. complex, but it could happen. It Anything could. happens. Mm -hmm. Parents message me all the time and they're like, is it normal for my kid with apraxia <laughs> too? And what do you think the answer always is from me? Yes, everything's yes. normal. Yes. Everything is normal. Because every yes, kid because, is different. Yeah. Because motor planning, movements for sounds is individual to every child who struggles with a motor planning disorder. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, but let's say if we did have milk, the nice thing is, is that you can teach them what they did Mm -hmm. within that word that they might have like milk that you can get on demand you can teach them what they did with their lips you know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. again understanding that i'm going to be dealing with over three where you're under right. three but when yeah. i see something like that then i can say like oh yeah you closed your lips and used your humming sound mm -hmm. let's try and do it for ma can you try that let's do milk yeah you used your humming sound now try let's do ma and a lot of times i can get it because you just they're like oh is that what i did to right. make milk <laughs> and that's the feedback right the feedback yes. that is going to be one of the we things we will get to I, that yeah i hope i have it on here now i don't even know you do, I tried you do. Too. <laughs> thank goodness oh my goodness i don't even know that i do laura i don't know i think i forgot that one um okay so somebody asked and i feel like i need to answer this question let me see where it is now um oh do you have any ideas of how to put wish list of words onto like an ifsp i don't know that it would ever get onto an iep it could because a teacher could be giving specific words that are used frequently in the classroom. But what I would do, because in, on an IFSP in early intervention, we can write um, uh, parent-focused outcomes. And so you could write that, um, you know, Joey's parents will create a wish list of words, um, of high-frequency words that are regularly used during family routine. So, I mean, you could write it as an IFSP outcome. I've never worked in the schools, so writing IEP goals is certainly not my forte. Laura might be able to answer something more about that. But I just am a firm believer in pulling um, target words from the curriculum if you work in a school, you know, if they're in science, what are, you know, what are they, what are they working on this week? I mean, my son, you know, was working on things like evaporation and condensation for a kiddo with a praxy of speech. Those are extremely challenging words. When my son had to give a PowerPoint, my son's in 10th grade now, he had to give a PowerPoint oh, online, I mean, just this year for online learning. And it was on um, Michelangelo, you know, so I mean, just saying that word and he had to say it over and over. So every night we practiced his talk target words that were pulled directly from his PowerPoint. So parents, you just, and teachers just need to know what, what is the child focusing on? If you're reading a book, let's just say you pull some random book off the shelf, look through it real quick and pick your three or four target words. You know, what words occur over and over and over? Um, I think I talked about this one last week, but blueberries, if your kid loves blueberries, this word blueberries occurs like 28 times in this one book. Yeah, so you obviously, did show that book last time. Yeah, your, 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 your target word then is going to be blueberries. Why? Because your kid loves blueberries, right? And you found a book at the library on blueberries. So um, it is. Yeah, important. and that's why it's important in terms of an IEP, why you always want to document that CAS was in the history. Because even though CAS might not be an appropriate label, at some point, this is another thing. Oh my God, it could be another topic. Parents it want could. to keep the apraxia label when the kid looks resolving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not appropriate for an SLP to continue to say your child has, you know, apraxia when they are looking phonological or they only have a residual articulation error. Right. However, it history. is important to document that mm -hmm. apraxia was in the history because it is frequently reported, as Carrie just pointed out, when they get into middle school and into high school, when they have to learn those, um, you know, lesser known uh, multisyllabic words like evaporation or, um, you know, a foreign language. I don't know if your son right. was required to take a foreign language, but I've heard that was um, hard for a lot mm -hmm. of kids because mm -hmm. it's a whole other motor plan of words they don't know. Exactly. Um, and so as long as you have that documented, it should always be documented somewhere that's Yes, was in the history. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I've seen a couple people um, ask about how to find a speech language pathologist who specializes in CAS. Laura, tell us how to do that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm really like, you know, Sharon Gretz, who, if you guys didn't catch the beginning, um, she means a lot to me. She was the founder of Kisana, who is now Apraxia Kids, and this is the glass I'm drinking out of. And it really was, she got this question all the time, and it really was her mission, and that is why I have, you know, a training called boot, uh, boot Camper, is what we call it, but it's just advanced training in Apraxia, and it's why she conceptualized it, was that parents did ask this, and we do need to know. So, you know, there are a couple of things that I would advise you to do. One um, is ApraxiaKids.org 
does have a tab, find a therapist. And so you can just type in your zip code and area, and it will show you people who um, have passed the test and that are apraxia experts. And then it'll show you who's received apraxia kids' training specifically with a yes. But I mean, either way. And then what I would recommend doing is, I was just talking about earlier, I have these top 10 questions on my website for SLP, for parents to ask SLPs. And um, it really, I had a parent once, and that's why I wrote this blog, is she came down, she was 45 minutes away from me, she came down, got the apraxia diagnosis for me, and she's like, I can't drive this every time. She's like, what, how do I find someone closer to me? And so I gave her a list of questions, and she was tenacious, and she called 21 people or something. <laughs> and she asked them all these questions, and then, it, you know, she went with her mommy gut based on how confident people were in responding, how, you know, what they said, and we found someone actually that now I, I adore like you know she's 45 minutes from me and I trust her and I would refer anyone to her and she is listed on the apraxia kids website too but I'm just saying there are people out there that might know what they're doing that haven't taken the test or whatever right, but right well I mean those are my recommendations what are yours yeah, yeah well no I, I mean I'm not even on the apraxia kids uh, uh, SLP yeah stuff that's a good exam exactly so why can I tell you why so you're not treating I can't take any referrals. Yeah, I only see yeah, exactly. because I'm a professional speaker. So if I put yeah. my name on that list, I'm going to have my doors, you know, not, yeah. I mean, and not you can't see stop. anyone. So even though I'm an apraxia specialist, I choose not to be put on that list because my way of helping more children around the world is through professional development. Yeah. So I'm a professional speaker now after 25 years of practicing, this is what I do is travel and, you know, write seminars and things like that because I feel like I can help more kids that way. Um, but I still, I mean, I just got an email from a lovely lady. I think she's in Mississippi who asked, can I come to Kansas city and just, can you see him every day for like a mm. week? Like I would give anything because parents are desperate and I know I you know. parents are desperate. And that's why Laura and I are trying very hard to support apraxia kids so that we can get more SLPs who become specialists, you know, who go to boot camp, who take ongoing training, the apraxia kids. Can we just give them a plug, Laura, the apraxia kids uh, conference. There's an annual conference. Every yeah. July. It's always the second week in July. So this year it's July 8th through 10th. It's 100% online, isn't it, Laura? Didn't it go 100% online? I think online? it is this year, yes. It is yeah. actually. No, I know that for sure. Yeah, it is all online. I'm not actually presenting this year because I prefer to do it in person. So, but I, I've already bought my, I mean, I'm attending, I'm going to attend every single course that I possibly can um, because this is how you learn about the newest research. It is um, a, a conference for both professionals and for parents. Just know that there are courses designed specifically for parents. So if you are a parent, no matter what country, wherever you are, because this one's going to be online, you guys, you're going to be able to watch them at a later date. A lot of them, I just looked at the schedule. The schedule just came out today. There's seven several for early intervention. There are several for literacy. You know what I mean? There's all these different topics, but it's specific to childhood apraxia of speech, and you can watch them kind of on demand for a very short period of time. Do you know what I mean? The conference is from the 8th through the 10th, but I think the way I'm reading it is they're going to be available. So you guys- And they were um, last year, so I would probably say that's true. Yeah, yeah. So it's just important that whether you're a professional or a parent, um, you're going to have to um, dig deep and continue to educate yourself because this is not something that unfortunately is, um, I don't know, it's not taught very well at the grad school level in most universities still. Um, and um, I think parents are in the dark a lot of times. Somebody asked, Lauren, I would love for you to answer this because I just have to grab your book now. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, you're so um, sweet. <laughs> well, no, because somebody asked a specific question. So Laura's book, if you're not familiar with it, um, I'm the queen if this is your first year of pulling books off my shelf. I know <laughs> you guys, you're going to get used to this. Yeah, um, overcoming apraxia. So somebody asked, is it okay to say apraxia is resolved even though it's a lifelong disorder? So Laura, I would love That's for you to That's what I was just that. answering. I was just oh, answering that I'm question while you were talking. It. Yeah, if you're okay yeah, with that. Yeah, well, gonna, I'm going to hit send, but what I'm going to, I'll hit send here to this person so it's there for everyone, but um, it is a controversial word for sure. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, it's not a, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't really know. It is the word that we have right now to describe individuals who are presenting acoustically as though we can't detect any differences. What we do know is that, yes, it's a lifelong disorder. What we do know, and I did, if you guys have checked out my YouTube channel, I did a lot of Zooms with adults with CA, who grew up with CAS, and all of them reported that there was something internally still happening, whether it was in a job interview, whether it was like getting stuck on words, whether it was having word finding, things like that, that I'm not, I might not necessarily clinically be able to detect. And so 
Yes, that so it is controversial. So, you know, I feel like the now that we have the diagnosis of CAS only occurred in 2007 is definitive by ASHA. So if you think about that, 2007 really wasn't that long ago, but we finally got those, you know, that criteria characteristics. And now we have these children who grew up with CAS that are able to tell us whether they agree with that term or whether they don't. And, you know, if you guys follow Carrie, she's, you know, into the, in, she's in the autism community. And it's important to listen to adults who actually have the disorder. Absolutely. So I'm going to use resolved right now because that's the accepted terminology. But certainly if there is a later date, adults who say we don't like this term, I'm right. fine with that too. So all I want to add to that is what we as SLPs have to, uh, Laura used the perfect word, acoustically. How does the child sound? Yeah. So the child's speech sound errors are now more consistent with the diagnosis of. SLP, yes. SLPs, write this down. The yes. child's speech sound errors are now more consistent with the diagnosis of phonological impairment or uh, our residual articulate. The child's speech yep. now contains residual articulation errors. The child has yes. a history of childhood apraxia of speech. And you guys, one of the best things you can document once you know this to be true, and if you listen to adults with apraxia, um, Jordan or Mikey, is um, I've had many... Um, Allie, she's another one where mm -hmm. um, adults will say, okay, look, for the most part, I can talk and I'm intelligible, but um, there are times when I've heard, I can't think who said it, my apraxia comes back. And what this person said was, it's if I'm really tired, if I'm not feeling well, or if I'm really anxious it seems harder for me to motor plan the words. So it's yeah. almost like I do pretty good. And it reminds me so much of stuttering, Laura. I'm certainly it not a stuttering too. specialist, but people oh, who, me I mean, all you do is listen to the president of the United States, right? So if you stutter and you can, you, you are pretty fluent most of the time, but are there going to be times where you get caught up where yep, it affects there you? Are. So that is why when we say apraxia is resolved, what we mean is in the day-to-day -day conversations, like my son, if you heard him talk, you'd be like, he doesn't have apraxia of speech. And I'd yep. say, well, no, it's resolved. But when he says, <laughs> right. what was the word I gave you? Evaporation or condensation yep. or whatever that word is, the apraxia comes back, you guys. Yeah, so that's yeah. what we mean by it's resolved. We're talking about in general day-to-day -day conversation, the child or the, the person is intelligible for the most part. Their mm -hmm. speech may be a little off. Do you know what I mean? Like vowel errors continue to be yep. sometimes they're, they're vowel just or quick. prosodic errors. Sometimes I hear yeah. these like, um, prosodic errors that uh -huh. definitely uh -huh. present as a little odd. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I that's just what that's that's just the accepted term right now. But certainly, right. it is lifelong. It is neurological. Neither I, I'm sure, Carrie, neither you or I are going to sit here and say it's not neurological nor right. lifelong. It is right, exactly. So yeah. not that. And then we'll probably have to end. I, maybe we'll try to do one more. If you guys want to stay on five more minutes, but I just want to give you one example. Okay, so I am an eight-year breast cancer survivor, and because I got breast cancer at a fairly young age, the first thing they did was tested me for the BRCA gene. Okay, and the BRCA we know of. There's BRCA one and BRCA two mutations. Um, and so lo and behold, I have the BRCA1 mutation. So for me, it wasn't a matter of if I was going to get breast cancer, it was a matter of when. So I have been through all my treatment. I had a very um, uh, 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 fast growing tumor. Um, so I had to have uh, 18 weeks of chemo and had a double mastectomy, full hysterectomy, everything, right? And so I no longer have breast cancer, right? It's gone. But if you test my blood. If you, you know, look at my DNA, I will always have the BRCA1 mutation. So what did the treatment do? The treatment got rid of the symptoms, but because it's part of my DNA, it's part of who I am, I will always have the BRCA1 mutation. Mm -hmm. So I kind of think about that, like Ashlyn has a praxy of speech, right? I mean, it's there. It's something, it's part of her neurology, if you will, but she functions pretty well, right? She's communicative, yeah. she's verbal. I mean, yep. there's other things going on now, but is apraxia part of her history? Is it part yes. of her DNA? Is it part of her neurology? It is, but it's resolved. And here's why, you guys, because therapy works. If <laughs> therapy wasn't effective in improving the symptoms of a speech disorder, then why in the world would anybody pay for speech therapy? What we do I is think it was you it. that wrote the meme. You should repost it. It, it got funny. a lot of traction. It was... Uh, Therapy is the medicine for apraxia or something. Oh, oh, something like that, probably. Something yeah. like that, yeah. Really? Because it's it, true. Without, I mean, if therapy, you guys, you just have to think about this. If speech therapy wasn't effective, 
then we would have a bunch of kids with apraxia who still couldn't talk, yeah, right? It's so true. I mean, it's, yeah, it's true. And in fact, I mean, there, you know, there are people, because I'm friends with Jordan from Fighting for My Voice, there are adults who are older than him who reach out to him and say that very thing you know like I have this and I can't speak to people or if I speak to people no one understands me it's absolutely heartbreaking um, and that's why we're here so and, and early the early the earliest the better because the brain is the most plastic between zero and three that doesn't mean if your kid is 10 there's no all hope is lost that's right. not what I'm saying what I'm saying is the best outcomes we want to get occurs in early intervention and, and that's why Carrie's so passionate because that is her area of expertise um, but I want to, I want those kids to get help right away and get the appropriate help. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's do one more and then we're going to be done where we are going to make. Well, I was thinking, wait, like, let's think about this real quick. Cause okay. I was thinking about the graphic. Cause we kind of went through focus on movement, practice the target where, oh wait, no, 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 no. Sorry. 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 We, we did target we selection. We did, <laughs> we've only done three. Okay. You're yeah. right. We need to do another one. Yeah. So we're going to have to do this. We're going to continue this next week, but let's no, do the, we did four. Choose a smaller number of speech targets. Well, we didn't specifically say that. We, we didn't specifically. But I feel like it was embedded. Right. But yeah, five, go ahead. Five to ten. I mean, the point is, you don't take a deck of flashcards and go, let's no. work on these 30K words, right? That's articulation therapy. That's not motor planning therapy. So that's why we pick words that are relevant, meaningful, high-frequency words. And I always say five. If the child um, has any kind of, you know, intellectual impairment, if there's any cognitive delays, I'd even start with one or two words. You know what I mean? Like I, I wouldn't even necessarily do five, but if you listen to Jenny Bjorum or any of the other apraxia specialists, like five is kind of this, I don't know, five to 10. Would you say, Laura, with older kids, you could maybe do a few more than five? Yeah, with my older kids, I usually, well, it depends because we're always going to meet the child where they're at. Right, right. So five is always tends to be good for my minimally verbal or like very, mm -hmm. very limited sound repertoire kids. Um, if I've got kids with some good sound repertoires and some good language coming into me at three mm -hmm. or over, definitely I'm going to look at five to even up to 15, I might do because okay. they can very handle good. it. But cogn again, you meet the child where they're at. What is the cognitive? Right. What is the receptive? What is the attention? What is the behavior? What is, there's so many things that go there into are. me deciding how many I'm going to choose. So that's why if we say five, we're, we're ensuring that you're going to get the reps that you need to right. make the changes in the motor planning that we need. Right. In the brain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So guys, um, I would love it if you would tell us, should we do one more or do you want us to wrap up for tonight? Cause we've been on an hour and six minutes. So well, I, I feel it. like we were hovering around 160 and we just dropped to 130. I feel like people like, it They're seems done. like, yeah, They're don't done. you? Okay, if we go ahead and call it good for tonight. And what we'll do is we'll do a better job next week of starting right away. We won't have like any <laughs> talk. We'll just get going on strategy. So we can I mean, we you. say this, but I'm, we're going to do our, we're, we're, we can do it, Carrie. We we're can. committed. We're just very passionate. If you go to my website, I'm Laura and I are both going to post this on Facebook, right, Laura, yeah. when we get yeah. done. But you guys are welcome to download the free infographic um, that has all of the strategies. And if you kind of want to look at it, then if you come back next week, you'll kind of have an idea. And maybe yeah, you know, that's you a great a idea. Quicker. So we will certainly um, post that. And again, if you want to tell your friends about this or whoever, these are all available on either Laura's page. Did you share it on I Instagram too, Laura? Yep. I shared it both and I shared it in my stories um, for sure. Okay. And I don't know how to do that. So I just, it'll be on my Facebook page <laughs> forever and ever. So you guys take care and um, Laura, let's cheers to another. Let's cheers. And while we do that, if I could just say, if you liked this video, if this was helpful to you, we would love to just see your likes, your hearts or anything like that. Um, you know, we are kind of doing that. I mean, it's fun for us, obviously, it but is. it is time consuming and Carrie, especially making these infographics, you guys, what she's giving you, I, I just, Carrie, I just thank you even for me to you. It's just incredible. I know how much time it takes. So, um, yeah. Anyway, so Very cheers, good. Carrie. Yes, cheers. And we'll be back Thursday night next week, I think, right? Yeah, Thursday night. I think Thursday. the plan is Thursday night. We'll, we'll just stick with 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern. So if you're from Greece and it's 3 a.m., oh, my gosh, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Let us know when we can come to Greece and visit. So you guys take care, and we will see you next week. All right. Yay. All right. And we're getting all the loves and likes and hearts. Oh, so thank wonderful. you guys. That's we appreciate we want, that. Yeah, we appreciate it. Again, it is fun for us, but we certainly want, um, you know, um, to uh, know that it is helpful for you guys. So we appreciate it. All right. Take care, guys. We will see you next week. Bye, Laura. Bye.